Uh, 74.3% of you who are watching right now on YouTube are not subscribed to our YouTube channel. Interesting. 74.3% of you are not subscribed. Good with his statistics. Over what there. in the world are you doing? You Like coming to a shul and not paying membership. You put a thing in the sucker box. We're not asking for your money. Just hit the subscribe button. It's free. <laughs> hit it. Come on. Let's turn those numbers upside down. Uh, anyways, that's my that's my uh, plea for today. Anyways, for you. this episode is powered by Alpert and Associates. Right? Momo, the importance of buying life insurance. Guys and gals, you know, you, what you spend going out to eat on, on a Tuesday afternoon is probably more money than what you'd spend buying like term life insurance. Yeah, some basic term life insurance. It's so important. You know, no one, I know no one wants to think about it and it's uncomfortable and you don't want to take care of it. But when something happens, you want your family to be taken care of. You want the people who you love most, who you live day in and day out for to be taken care of. And, and it's literally it's just adulting. It's adulting. It's yeah. the responsible thing. You get married, you sign that Suba, you get your wife a ring, you get life insurance. It, I, it, it's, it's that simple. So if you're out there and you're married, maybe you have a kid, you don't have a kid, you're married, go ahead, call Moshe Alpert today. Call Moshe Alpert today and get started on this, on this, uh, on this journey of getting life insurance, which is not a long, it's not a long journey and it's not a difficult journey, but it's an important one. That's albertmoshe at gmail.com or you can give him a call at 718 718- Six four four one five nine four, and this episode is sponsored by our friends at Yid Cards. Yid Cards. The days of getting an invitation in the mail are soon to be gone because you're going to get a letter. You're going to get not a letter. You're going to get it in your email. Yes, a beautiful, beautiful email, a beautiful link to an invitation that is singing and dancing and doing all the things that a paper invitation cannot, and that only <laughs> comes from YidCards.com. Yid Cards happens to be extremely geschmack. Yeah. I've seen a couple of them. Check it out. Invite someone to something that you're doing. Uh, Nahi, did you end up sending a Yid card to a guest? I sent a Yid card. Because I might have challenged you to do that. Maybe you did. And that's why I'm going to head to YidCards.com and do that. So, Momo, this week we sat down with Blimi Heller, who is a parenting coach, a child advocate, and... She is, she's doing so much. She's doing so great at what she does. There is a lot of wisdom in this episode. So sit down. She, yeah, she really packs, she really packs it in. Yeah. She has a lot to say, a lot to share. Very fresh perspective on parenting mm -hmm. and building relationships between parents and children. Yeah, so maybe you know her from Instagram, or maybe you don't have Instagram, you don't have no idea, but if you're a parent, or even if you're a kid, a teenager, we got you as well in this Very conversation. Good. So listen big, listen clearly, you're listening to Meaningful People Podcast with Blimi Heller. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Mrs. Heller, how are you? Welcome. welcome welcome to your episode of meaningful people right yeah i'm really excited How thanks for that? having me oh it's a pleasure of course. it's a pleasure it's a pleasure to be here Momo, how's your mic Nahi? every time i come here someone finagled with it but we know what we're gonna be okay we're gonna be okay i'm not about perfection the product of finagleage yes mine's pretty heavily finagled as well is it yeah who's playing some, around with your stuff i don't know, I don't know. we have like, to figure it out we're gonna put some surveillance cameras in here yeah. this episode is sponsored by sprite is it though is it though <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, so thank you so much for making the trip. You traveled all the way from... Tom's River, New Jersey, which is basically Lakewood. Is it though? <laughs> you is it though? You heard, you heard the framing. I am going all in on that. You heard the framing, which is basically Lakewood. It depends. <laughs> it depends in what in what context you're saying it, but that's really cool. You like Tom's River? We have, we've I had a it. number of guests from Tom River. Tom's River, by the way. Rabbi, ba Rabbi Babad. Yes. Right. Rabbi Ozer Babad. Who else? Um, there was a, there was a other discussion of Tom's river, maybe with, <laughs> with Shirley Besser. I'm not going to dig you out of this one. Yeah, well. Bensi Schechter. We talked about that's a name drop. Michael Bess. How are you? dude? It's, a, it's another name drop, right? Um, anyways, I, people I love Tom's river. We I love it. I love it. Aesthetically. Yeah. It's different than Lakewood for me. So, and I like it. I'm from Toronto, right? And so nice. yeah, aesthetically it's similar to Toronto. I find where I live. Toronto. Like the house. Yeah, Toronto. Toronto. Right. I don't say Toronto. My siblings do some of them, but yeah, mm. I say like Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> My grandmother, yeah. she should be gazint. She's 98 years old. She's been living in Toronto. What's her name? For Ida Tenenbaum. She was married to Herschel Tenenbaum for uh, 46 years. My parents would for sure know who you're talking about, but I don't know. By yeah. the time this airs, maybe Her first know. husband was Moshe Iron Bauman, for whom I'm named. And then he passed away when my father was like 20. And my parents got married, and then about a year later, 
My grandmother remarried Mr. Herschel Tenemam, who was an incredible yid, lived in Toronto. He was a pillar of the Aguda there. And that's why I say Toronto. <laughs> you're so Haley. There's a lot of information leading up to that today. Yeah. So, you're, so you're like almost like a native there. Oh, pretty much, basically, yeah. <laughs> Momo, this is like your episode of Meaningful People, no? Very deep. <laughs> Very deep. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're you're really good at what you do. Um, we're gonna just we're gonna sort of you know give a description of who you are in the in the intro to this episode, which is what people are gonna hear as soon as they click on this episode. Um, so they heard it already. They heard it already at this point crazy what we have to do not in this conversation they haven't heard it but yet. you haven't heard it yet i'm that, getting play-by-play play right now yeah <laughs> i think it's the coffee by the way um anyways so you you are a parent coach you te- you teach courses mm-hmm. but let's let's peel it back a bit you know how does a parent coach i mean like when you're a kid are you like i want to be a parenting coach because mm. your parents might be like what so yeah. take us back to your childhood yeah so actually as a child i was always very passionate about being a good parent Wow. Whatever that means. Yeah. Yes. And I even as a, and not only was I, was I passionate about that, I also was really passionate about the injustices towards children. Mm. I felt like as a child, I was treated as less than, not only by my parents, you know, society. I'm not, this is not even an indictment towards my parents. It's mm. teachers, schools. Like I just, talking down? Like, yeah. Like as if I wasn't an equal member of society, just like these are the rules and this is what has to be done. And if I would ask for an explanation, it's like, I would be shot down. It's like, you're not supposed to ask. And I really felt like I always felt slighted by that. I Interesting. Was, yeah. Yeah. You know, Interesting. What? I also probably felt that I was, I was, I want to say I was chutzpah but I felt like I, <laughs> that niggin by the way is always the one where it's exactly what I'm saying. Like oh. not that I was chutzpah right. Or like not in a bad way, but like what is about to happen is extremely chutzpah dick and an extremely bad way. No. <laughs> I, yeah. I believe him actually. Cause you know I was never chutzpah dick. I was right. never, I'm not never. Okay. But rarely ever teachers would have called me a pleasure. I was like really? their favorite, but I still felt slighted. I wouldn't share it out loud. But inside, I really, really felt it was unfair. I didn't like it at all. Like children don't have the same rights. Yes. It's like you're, the, but I feel like children are so intuitive. Yes. Mm. I'm sure we'll get to more of that. So you felt like you, you, yeah. So you, so you ran for president of your school. What did you do? No, I didn't do any of those things. It was oh. so not me. No, I'm so not that type. Actually, I was really like not into those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I did have this internalized sense of like children aren't treated fairly or like, you know, like you said, they're talked down to, they're treated a second gla- class really. And so I went into parenting with that. First, I wanted to be a really good parent. Second, I really wanted to treat my child differently. Okay. Um, and it started out pretty good, but then it started going really down <laughs> downhill when I was struggling with my oldest. Like it was nice to have all these ideas in theory, but then in practice, like I just ended up doing what I what everybody else yeah. did. You know, set yeah. my child for time out and then, you know, punish her and reward her and make charts and all the things that I really hated when they were done to me, I did to her because I didn't know what else to do. Like even though I didn't love them, I was sort of left with what do I do though? Well, why would you do it differently? Because like I said, I really had this I had this uh, inclination not to do it i know i feel like you know everyone kind of wants that though like when you're when yeah. i feel like when i was a teenager oh when i'm a parent i'm gonna do x y and z like there you I, go. one small example like i remember when i was younger i wanted a dog my parents like listen when you get married and you have kids you get a dog yeah. i'm not getting a dog <laughs> i'm not walking no dog i'm changing diapers i'm not taking a dog out i'm walking a dog and it's like you know, but like, oh, I couldn't believe my parents. Why are you not getting me a dog? I, you're so cruel, but I'm doing the same cruel, right? It's like a cycle. So first of all, Nahi, you should totally get a dog. I am not getting do a dog. Do you have a dog? We do not. Oh, okay. Do you have a dog? No, my kids are begging for one. Are you Two of one? my siblings, no, not now. No. Two of my siblings have one though. So, but yeah, I think that you're right. A lot of people do feel that way as teenagers. My sister actually said, I want to write a journal so I don't forget all the promises I made to myself when I was a teenager. Like, huh. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. She's like, I don't want to forget. Did she do because that? She didn't actually, oh, okay. but I don't think she, I don't think she forgot. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that a lot of times we do because we don't have anything else. And it's like, what? well, this is what everybody does. And this is what children need. And we're also indoctrinated by our culture. Like we don't realize how much I think um, by like, this is just the way it's done. And this is what children need. And this is what, yeah. and so I sort of went along with that until it came to a head where I was having such a hard time with my child. And I hated the way I was parenting her, like hated it. And I remember thinking like, if I continue going down this route, we're going to end up where she's going to hate me and not going to want to talk to me anymore at some point. And I really, I knew I never wanted that. And so I was like, I have to do things differently. 
I didn't know what I was going to do differently, but I was, I'm the kind of person who loves researching things. I get obsessed with the, mm. <laughs> with these things. And so, and I love psychology. I, I always read those books when I was a little kid anyway. So I like dove into parenting and I read from all the experts and, um, eventually I came across like really interesting things that I had never read before that sort of suggested that all the like punishments and rewards and uh, the way we've been doing things doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. There are other ways to do things with kids. And it really inspired me and spoke immediately to my inner child, like to the mm. child in me who was like, I knew it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I knew children didn't need to be treat, don't need to be treated this way. And I, I really, it, it like, it fed into everything that I had already known and believed inside of myself. And so I sort of became a child advocate. That's what I call myself. That's really cool. Was yeah. there a, I guess, was there something in your childhood that um, drew you to this thing? Was there maybe, you know, there are always some siblings that are like parent siblings. You know, yes. like there are player coaches. Like yeah. the older player. I was definitely player. more of a parent sibling, yes. <laughs> parent sibling? <laughs> yeah. Was that, was that you growing up? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. How, how'd that like practically, how would that look like? Um, I, 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 my sister just said, she called me the emotional parents. She oh. said, you were the emotional parent, you know? <laughs> so meaning like if this child, if some one of the siblings had something to share emotionally, they would come to me. You know, I was the one who would listen to them or whatever. So you're I, destined for this. Yeah. Kind of. Are you on the older side of the hierarchy? <laughs> yes. Yes. Siblings? Yes. Uh, one of the older ones. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So then when I read it, it really spoke to me. No one needed to convince me that this was like made sense because I knew it made sense. And I, even though it was radical when I first started, it was, it was considered more radical than it is now. Really? Yeah. I can't wait to hear what I it still is. Think, <laughs> I still think it is considered somewhat radical, the things that I talk about. Sometimes for some people, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but that that's fine. They don't have to agree with me. Am I going to be uncomfortable? Um, you might. I don't, I don't think you will. <laughs> I don't know. Nice glasses, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, go on. I wanted to uh, stop for a moment yeah, sure, on sure, sure. That, that relationship with what you were learning and how it was just intuitively resonating with yes. what you always believed was the case. Yes. Um. It's reminiscent of the Gemara Nida teaches us that a fetus mm -hmm. learns kola terakula mm -hmm. in the womb. So by the time a baby, by the time an ashama comes into the world, mm -hmm. it already experienced yes. the entire scope of Tyra knowledge. And that's why when someone learns something that is truthful mm -hmm. in their lifetime, yeah. mm -hmm. it has the feeling of remembering something Correct. that they know already this. know. And that's that's pretty cool. That that's how you experience this. Yeah. It's very cool. I yeah. feel like we had that that thing with a different guests as well. Maybe Dr. Henry Abramson about history. Maybe like you know, like you're you get into certain fields. Like why am I in this field? And that just that that was what you're. Yeah, yeah. I feel I I feel like this is what I was destined to do. But it's so funny what you said before. I heard it from Rabbi Kiva Tatz, and I used to start my courses out by saying that. And I would say check if it resonates with you. Mm. Like if you you know if this is resonates as truth. I know for me it does, but I don't want to impose something onto you. And if it resonates, so yeah, I love that you you mentioned that. Um. So so then I I became I wasn't even going to share it with parents yet. Really, it was really more about me. And, yeah. and I was like, okay. So once I heard all these ideas, I was like, great, I'm going to incorporate this into my home, into my parenting. And I did. And it was not easy. It was really, really hard. There were days that I wanted to just throw in the towel and be like, whatever, I'm just going to do the way I did, always did it. But of course, I, I didn't want to. So I would always go back to this place. And it was transformational. It was it was literally transformational. My relationship with my child changed dramatically. She didn't change. I always say she did not change. She's the same person she was and she's beautiful the way she is. But um, our relationship changed and I loved parenting so much more. And I remember thinking like other parents need to know this. Why is it there only one way to do things and the way everyone else has done it? And why can't there be other information out there for parents to choose and be like, wait, this speaks, this resonates more with me. This is what I want to do. So yeah, so I'm a sort of a child advocate slash parenting coach. And I went out there and just decided to share this information. Sorry, cool. And I find that people are very like, it does resonate with people. <laughs> That's why I think I have as many followers as I do. I think people are drawn to it. Yeah. I think it speaks to their inner child. And they're like, I would have wanted to be treated that way. People say that straight out to me. And so, um, yeah. It sounds like, it sounds like an infomercial so far. And for nine ninety nine, <laughs> we can get your child Brodius. to bed on time. <laughs> information for transformation. So Momo is not on social media, but for, yeah. for your contact, she has like 156,000. Seven. Oh, wow. I, I knew you were going to go with that. <laughs> You tell someone how many followers they have, and if you're one off on the <laughs> lower end, it's up. And if you say, if I said 158, you'd be like, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he probably knows. I would yeah. correct you why. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. like one. Yeah. I do the same thing, by the <laughs> That's way. That's hysterical. Um, yeah. But you have 156,000 followers, and we were, spoke, we were speaking. Seven. Oh, my bad. I wasn't going to correct him again. I was like, it's fine. I'll let it go. I got you. 157,000 followers. Those 1,000 people are like, what about? Um, yeah. And like, 
that happen from you giving over this all organic type. i've never done giveaways i've never been part of these things I, it was never what i wanted to do no i don't want swag wanna, i don't want to be an influencer i don't want to be a blogger that's not my thing i just had a message that i wanted to get out there i'm passionate about it and that's all i did so let's talk fire let, yeah, let's, fire spread let's get to the like what's the secret sauce like what oh is this this thing what is what is it yeah. So, well, when you say secret sauce, what comes to my mind is like, there's a way to make your children behave. And I'm like, that's actually what I'm not about at all. I don't even know if that's what you meant, but that's what I have in my mind when I hear that. My approach is not about that at all. And that's why I love it so much. It's about recognizing that you actually cannot control the outcome at all. And so let's focus on what we can control, which is the relationship that we have with our child. And that's really the secret sauce. The secret sauce is the relationship you have with your children. And it's not just because, oh, that's the only thing I can focus on. Actually, like all, again, studies and research, I, I take it with a grain of salt because yeah. it's so fickle. It's always changing. And I think that the research only, it's its nice add-ons to sort of back up what we already know and believe. But but there happens to be, there's a ton of research that shows that the relationship that we have with our children is literally the framework for life. Um, it's the secret to mental and emotional health. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, I always quote that him. That is a Strong name. name. Wow. Yeah. Strong name. Top five name I've ever heard in my life. Sit, sit. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Bessel? Right? One Bessel. Second. Bessel. He's you a guys Dutch. are all on the last name. Bessel? <laughs> a Dutch psychiatrist. Okay. He has a famous quote that says, the parent-child connection is the most powerful mental health intervention known to mankind. Mm. That's it. Now, again, is it a guarantee just because of a good relationship, your kids are never going to experience mental, emotional issues? No, none of these things are guarantees. But we're talking about what the research shows, what's a, you know, a great predictor. Yeah. And it really, really is. And I think that a lot of, unfortunately, what happens in parenting, because we like have to teach right from wrong and get our children on the right track and have boundaries, that gets in the way of relationship. I find that, especially in generations past, I think a lot of times it was done at the expense of the relationship with the child. And so this is really about putting the relationship front and center and everything else sort of is not, I wouldn't say secondary to that, but happens through relationship. Meaning we never do something and we're like, oh, okay, we're just going to hurt the relationship because we want to teach them right from wrong. No, we're going to teach them right from wrong through the relationship, right. through connection, through relating to your child as a human being. And it another. becomes the vessel. There you go. It's the vessel. I always say that. From exactly. vessel. The vessel from vessel. <laughs> Very deep. Whatever. That's the name of the episode. So that's really it. That's the idea. And so, so it's and, and relationship means that you treat your child like a human being and yeah. with respect, deep respect. Not I, I I just did a podcast episode with somebody else and she said, You're the first person who sort of pointed out to me that a lot of the parenting people out there will talk about respect, but they talk about like a feigned sense of respect that's just like so the parent can get what they want out of the child kind of thing. And she's like, you're the first person who actually was like, no respect for the sake of respect, mm -hmm. you know, not to get anything out for, out of them, not to get, and that's it. It's what's real the, respect. What's the, ex you said some people, you know, radical, well, what's the radical? I'm, 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 I'm like an, ex mm. I'm not an extremist, but I like a good radical piece of content, you know, like <laughs> look at that camera and say the radical part. <laughs> no, what's the, I'm curious. What's the, what is what people would consider radical? Okay. What people find radical is that I take a little bit because I'm all about respect, treating like a human being. Sometimes I think people feel that there's not enough of like the parent child relationship. Like discipline. They're not even discipline because I, I definitely believe, yes, people are very into like the parent needs to be in charge. We hear a lot of those kinds of words in charge because then the child will think who's in charge here. I don't believe, I don't buy into any of those things. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Break it down for me. Okay. I do believe there's such a thing as permissive parents who kind of come with an energy of not really knowing what they're doing. And then those children might feel a little insecure, but I don't think it's like you have to be in charge. I don't think that's the, the idea isn't that the idea is to just yourself find the confidence and strength within yourself. It doesn't have to be about one person being in charge. Now there is a different role that you have. If I'm the parent, I do have a certain role. I have to provide, you know, security, safety for my child. I have to care for their needs. Structure. Kids crave structure, right? Um, I don't know if I would say structure. I would say rhythm, maybe more. That's a good predictability. I hear something that. like that. Yeah. I think that I don't know. Stability. I have, maybe. Stability. There you go. That's such Boom. a good word. I don't love the word structure because structure can sound very rigid and the people uh, this is where I'm also a little radical. I find that we put all kinds of things into parenting and we say like children need boundaries. They feel safe with boundaries, which I agree with to a degree. I think that we take it too far. And then we start saying children feel safe when we punish them. And I'm like, no, that's not what it means. Is it not true? I don't believe that. No, you don't feel that children feel safe when they get punished. No, do you, do you believe in, I never felt safe when I got punished? Do you, do you believe in punishing in general? No, I never punish my children. 
That's radical, right? See, that's pretty another, radical. Yeah. That's, that's, you, you never punish your children. Never. I have. Well, I used to punish my oldest, but no, I've never since that since for seven years I haven't punished my children. So ever. so uh, let's play this game. Okay. okay. So okay. Not well. I won't say yours. A child runs into the street. Yes. Car screeches, stops right in front of it. Yeah. Is that kid getting punished? No. Why not? Because it was my responsibility to make sure they didn't run to the street. They're a two-year-old or three-year-old. They clearly don't have enough impulse control not to do it. If they were 10 years old, first of all, they wouldn't run into the street. So I see it as developmentally it was appropriate for them to do that. It was my responsibility to make sure that they don't. But I want to make sure they don't do it again. Correct. So there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, is it, my res- is it their responsibility to make sure that they don't do it again? Maybe it's my responsibility to make sure that they don't do it again. Mm. Maybe they're not old enough for that yet. I think so much of parenting boils down to unrealistic expectations. It's also, it's like, the ah, you know what? You just stumped me. <laughs> you know? We have so many unrealistic expectations. I find this all the time with parents. I'll say, my child did this, and I said, they're five. This yeah. is what five-year-olds do. When he's 10, he's not going to do that. But he's five now, and so you're putting the responsibility on the child not to do something. Like somebody just said, I just saw someone say, you know, you a child, little child takes a scissor and cuts something up. So the parent gets all mad, punishes the child, it's... Put the scissors away. Why they have access to exactly. it? Exactly. Little kids are not supposed to have access to scissors. End of story. So right now, again, fault. if a twelve-year-old goes and cuts something with a scissor, that's a different story. I still wouldn't punish, but that's a different story. What do you do? What do you say? What would I do? Yeah. I would have a conversation with my child. So, so quick, I know you like doing this on your Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, a lot of what she does is she'll play both sides. You know, she'll pretend to be the child and then be mm. the adult and and mm. sort okay. of like. So I'm the twelve-year-old. Okay. okay. Yeah. I just for those that weren't watching, Naki was explaining that to me. Yeah, because Momo yeah. is a sheltered young lad. <laughs> um, I just, I ripped up this contract with a scissor and I'm 12. I'm supposed to know that. Yeah. Don't do that. That's not cool. Right. Insert mom. Yeah. So I would get really, the first thing I get is curious. I want to know what in the world happened. I don't just going to jump in and yeah. just start lecturing you. I want to know why you did it. Well, Clearly I did it because, I did it because like, um, I'm upset. I'm upset and okay. I, and I was honestly a little bored and okay. I just felt like destroying something. Yeah. So you were upset at, at me? Yeah, you, you're supposed to take me to go bowling the other day and you didn't. Yeah. And this work is more important than me, apparently. So I'm just going to cut it up. Right. Yeah. So it was a way of you letting me know how you wish that I was as important as the contract is or as something else or something like that. I guess. Subconsciously, probably. Yeah. You wanted, to, whatever it is, you wanted to let me know that I wish that I was important to you enough, more important to you than I seem to be or something like that. I see what you're doing, by the way. You're you're kind of like, you're you're not punishing the action. You're trying to understand the action. Yes. Oh, we'll get to the action in a moment. But first, I really want to understand because oh, I trust. Yeah. I'll tell you why. I truly trust that under every behavior is a need. This is true for all human beings, not just for kids. It's like communicative. It's, it is. Behavior is communication. So the child is trying to communicate something to me. And if I, I, and I'm missing an opportunity to really understand the child better and to teach the child better. Because if I don't understand what was happening for the child, there's no opening for me to really teach the child. See, punishing is a way of trying to control the child or, or try to change them from like the outside. I want to change them from the inside. So I want to look, I'll, I'll show you what I do. So Let's go. Where yeah. Are we at? So I'm going to understand where you came from. So first okay. I want to hear the precious, important, vulnerable message. It's like, you yeah. really wanted to know how important you were. And so first I'll empathize with that and understand where you were. Com- oh, wow. I get it. You really wanted to know how important you are, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then once I, 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 once I really understand you and you feel heard, then I'll say like, wow. Okay. So I totally get that. You wanted to let me know that. However, cutting up that thing is like completely not the way to do that because now you've ruined something that was really important and that I needed. You'll be able to hear that now because I've understood no, I feel you. feel bad. Exactly. So yeah, maybe it wasn't the best thing. Maybe there I should have just. Your own remorse will come up naturally. I don't even have to do much. You're so I be punish to... myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to let you punish yourself because you don't have to punish yourself. But naturally what happens is, is that we all feel remorse when we do something that we weren't supposed to do. But many times we have a really hard time accessing, accessing that remorse if someone comes to us with lecturing or with shame. Right. Or they don't understand us. I know when somebody doesn't understand me, I have a very hard time. I get very defensive. Yeah. Because I'm like, see, well, can you just understand why I did this? Right. And so when we first see why, the child is a much, a lot of times they naturally then feel remorse. And then a lot of times they naturally have a movement towards like, okay, how can I fix it? Or what can I do? Or, and so then we talk about it. And then I also say, okay, next time you feel like I'm not important to you, you're not important to me. And you want to let me know, how else can you let me know that isn't destructive? And we think of ways that they can let me know. And so, so uh, you know, uh, well, what are some ways? Because as, as a 12 year old, yeah, right. Like I don't know how to communicate that Correct. so well. I'm 12 and yeah. I communicate through doing things like ripping up important items. Right. You know, like I don't yeah. know how to express you know, a 12 year old yeah. doesn't know how to express that. Right. Well, hopefully the idea really is, is if you start this from a young age, children do know how to express it. OK, so they should we know. Bu- we, we build on it over time. We, we start this when they're three years old. We say when you're really upset at me because you feel like I'm not important, say I don't feel important to you. Like my 
That's what I teach my children. Is that dramatic? Yeah, twelve year olds, by the it, way, are a lot more capable than than you might. Right, but if they've never been taught, work. then maybe not. They've like never I, been taught, especially on boys. my way out of the house tonight. I asked my twelve year old daughter. I said, "I'm meeting with you," and I said, "What do you think is the hardest part about parenting?" And she said to me. You didn't say that, by the way. You said, what's the other? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did ask her specifically, what is yeah. the hardest? What do you think the hardest part of parenting is? And she said, I think the hardest part of parenting is knowing when your children are changing so that you know what they need. Wow. Mm, wow. That is really, really intuitive. So insightful. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah see, 12 year olds know a lot. What's her name? 12 year olds, Javi. Shout out, Javi. Yeah. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So 12 year olds do, and especially if you started this from a young age. Now, again, there are parents who are listening to this who I'm sure have not started this and their children are already 12, 13. Yeah. It's never too late. You can still teach a child who's 12, but you're right. Some children might not have the skills to communicate. Right. Okay. And, and, and I also want to propose something. You might say to the child, well, you can just communicate it. You can say like, mommy, I feel like I'm not important to you. Right. Or, or Tati or whatever, daddy. And first of all, the child has to trust that you're going to listen to that. Some parents, right. So you have to, yeah. it has to be something that, but some children say like, no, you know, I'm not going to say that. Mm. embarrassing i know i i even my kids sometimes say that I'm not say that <laughs> right so so then i i honor and respect that i'm not going to say well you just have to communicate that way we try to oh sorry we try to find something that that they do feel comfortable communicating right. so so i say well then do you feel comfortable saying like um i don't like what you're doing or i want you to pay attention to me or even writing it down maybe instead of instead of telling it to my face or we try to find something that meets them where they're at, not like trying to push them to do something they're not comfortable with at the same time that isn't destructive. And to me, this is really the role of a parent. I'm giving them skills for life. Like what kind of skill am I giving them by just punishing them? Mm -hmm. They have no idea how to communicate when they don't feel important. And then they get married and they still have no clue how to communicate when they don't feel important to their spouse. Guess what? Facts. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Trust me, I know. Drop the mic. Whenever I say this, everybody's like, oh, yes, I know exactly what you're talking Should about. Should be a chassan and teacher also. <laughs> so that's the thing is that's why I'm like punishments. Yes, it can stop things in its tracks, but it doesn't really teach anything. And I want to teach my children how to live life. Like, you know, children live what they learn and learn what they live. Right. And so I really want to live this from a very young age. I'm not looking to sort of just control them. It, it makes your job easier, probably. I, I find as it a parent. does. I find it does over time because I'm really just relating to them as a human being. And I find that this is also not another thing we have a thing in our culture about children that children are we have all these ideas about children and guess what you know why children are like that so much of the time it's because in a react in reaction to the way that we treat them if you feel like nobody ever listens to you or takes you seriously would you start banging walls and acting like a lunatic because you're like listen to me you might do something yeah, yeah exactly now some children go inward and don't do that but you might do that and then we look at them we're like crazy children they're just it's trying to, a desperate way exactly and then when you treat children like human beings and you talk to them like human being and you listen to them and you take what they take seriously they don't feel the need to resort to all these things and then people are like children are like this yeah children are like this they're human beings just like you and i now i don't want to take away the fact that children are developmentally they don't have a lot of skills so children will hit and push and pinch and whatever even if you parent this way when they're younger because they don't have the skills yet. I, I don't, I don't want to like put paint this picture that children yeah. are like magically angels. No, but again, by the time they're teenagers, they do have, they should have a lot more skills than if they were just punished. When I hear you advocating against the punishment mechanism mm -hmm. to modify behavior, mm -hmm. I'm reminded just of like these scientific experiments mm -hmm. where mice or rats are like subjected to some stimulus. Yes. And then there's like a negative shock. Yes. And eventually they hardwire themselves to not do that thing. Yes. And I'm hearing you say like, that's basically the mechanism of punishment. That's what it is. That's where it originates. Yeah. Behaviorism it's called. Yeah. Where, where, it started with animals. When did it originate? Like Pavlov and his dogs. How, what, what year is and that? Then I don't know exactly. And then Skinner came after him and he's like, Hey, we can try this on human beings too. It might work. And it did work. Well, I think the taking yeah. away punishing it kind of disarms parents from what they think is their only tool. 100%. I felt that way too. I remember when I first read about it, I was like, I remember one person specifically, she's like, just because we don't use punishment, she was advocating against it. She doesn't punish her children. And she's like, doesn't mean our children just run amok and do whatever they want. And I remember thinking like, how not? Like yeah. my child would just run amok and do whatever she wanted if I didn't punish her. I remember feeling that like lostness. It's so true. It's, it's a tool that we're so used to using. And, but it also exists within a paradigm. That's also why, like, if you want to adopt the way I'm talking, the way of parenting I'm talking about, you sort of have to shift everything. Yeah. It's not just like you can, like, take away punishment without changing, like, your entire mindset. Yeah. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. I, well, I wanted to bring up when I heard Nachi say, when Nachi was framing that, oh, when you adopt this model, it makes the parent's job easier. Yeah. I do believe that in the long term. Correct. But in the short term. Very hard. It requires, it's much easier and lazier to just check the punishment box, you know, and just put that into place and then continue with the rest of the hecticity of your day. Absolutely. And it requires, I, I think I'm, I'm hearing you say that it requires a lot more time, a lot more attention, and you can't just administer the punishment and move on, but it actually requires engagement Correct. with the child. Correct. But I also want to say like we're human beings and we have like, I, I have a friend who parents this way and she has seven kids. She doesn't always have time to like engage with every child. And that's fine because, you know, I don't either. Every single time they do something, I don't engage. But yeah, it's true. In the beginning, I think it takes more work on the parent. I think it does. Yeah, for sure. But over time, it does. I find in my experience, it it, it, it like the dividends pay off. It's just ends up being way easier because you don't have to constantly be controlling because you have conversations and you work together. And, and that's another big thing. And this is where also it's a little bit radical is that I really try to work together with my children as much as possible. So it's not, you know, I, I hear people saying like, I'm a yes parent. I try to say yes as much as possible. Again, I would also consider myself a yes parent, but I would actually say I'm a more working together parent than I am a yes parent. Meaning instead of simply saying no, I'll share the reason why I want to say no. And then I'll invite my child to find a solution that meets the reason why I want to say no. So child says, uh, they just got their license. They want to drive. Correct. Can I take the car tonight? Correct. In so I'll say like this. I'll say like, ooh, I really hear that you want to have the car. Here are my concerns with you taking the car tonight. I'm worried about you coming home too late. I'm also worried about that you might be, whatever. I'll share my concerns and I'll say, what do you think we can do about those things? Well, what if I and then my child on, counters yeah. back. Yeah. And I'll says- come back on time. Yeah. So I say, okay, so how do I know that's for sure going to happen? My child says, well, trust me. Or they say like, okay, fine. Can you remind me? Or we work something out together and I say, okay, great. Let's try that out. And then we try it out. And if my child doesn't come home on time, then we have another conversation. But what if you really, what if you don't want them to take, take the car for a reason that you just don't want to explain to them? I'm a parent. I don't want you going out tonight. I don't want you to take the car. Does that exist? It, it could exist if you wanted to. For me, it doesn't exist because I'm not looking to control my children. I'm really looking to work together with them and to create safety. So why am I hiding the reason from them? It's like super transparent. Yeah, it's like a yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. No, I, like you with me? I don't. It's, yeah. <laughs> no, I, this is this is big. This is where the rubber hits the road on the methodology. Yeah. If they're meaning to say, Nahi, you're the worst mom. <laughs> <laughs> what you were grappling with is if there's actually a reason, yeah. then what you're hearing is then let's unpack that reason. Correct. Let's truly identify whether the reason Correct. applies and if it could be resolved. But if there's no and reason. If it can't, then why wouldn't you let your kid have the car? Right, like, but I think Nahi's speaking to something. I'll tell you what I think it is. I think sometimes parents don't want to share a reason because they're yeah. afraid if they share the reason, then the child's going to counter it and then they're going to end up doing the thing. But here's the thing, what I'm advocating for is something that's very, that really, really, really addresses what I'm talking about. So if I share my my worry, I'm not gonna just say, yeah, okay, fine, 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 fine. If I'm really not, I don't feel like my worry has been addressed. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's what most parents are worried about. They're afraid if they say, uh, okay, let's say with driving the car, fine. So I'm, I'm gonna be home on time, but they don't really trust that the child's gonna be home on time. And then they're gonna have to say yes. So I would say that. I would say, I'm really, even though you're telling me you're gonna be home on time, I have because of blah, 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 that's happened in the past. I really don't, I really don't trust that you're gonna be home on time. I'm worried about that still. I still don't feel comfortable. Can we find something that really solidifies that and makes sure that you do? We'll be right back. Right back. <sighs> right back. It's like a dog barking in my yard. Is it though? We'll be right back to this episode in just a second. Right back. But first, a little bit about our friends at ILS, Infinity Land Services, because you know what? Just like the McGillis story that we just had in Purim. Interesting. So many different things went on. It's true. So many horrors. It's exactly like the McGillis. Nachi, tell us how it is like the McGillis. You know, Momo, is interesting because before we started recording this, you told me that it was exactly like the McGillis. <laughs> how is it like the McGillis? erroneous that's it you don't want to deal with, an, with a title company that's erroneous Haman was erroneous Achishverosh was erroneous do you want every single time that you mention your title company's name that everyone starts banging like we do by Haman <laughs> no you don't want that that's why you need to go to ilstitle.com best Haman um, obliteration by the way that I saw yeah Mark Mandelbaum Fetter Mark from Los Angeles <laughs> I hope the video went viral I don't know if what do you do someone sent it to me like in a text message yeah. And I know you mentioned a lot of times that I'm not on WhatsApp. You aren't. If someone like goes through the bother, through the tircha of sending me a clip. Must be good. In like iMessage, I get like the cream of the crop of content. S snail mail. Because <laughs> Mark Mandelbaum obliterated Amalek. What did he do? In, oh, you got to check it out. Uh, 
what he do? He, I'm not gonna. Okay, attempt. you know what? Maybe he mentioned the name of a different title company. That could be. I can tell you what he didn't do. He didn't mention ILS. That's Infinity Land Services. Check him out. ILS Title. Dot com. The the whole basis of what you're saying though yeah. is an unwavering honesty with your child. Correct. And that's that's something where I think I'm I'm stuck at is yeah. the, you you're holding on to the trump card of I'm the parent, period. Yeah. And that's what that's what you're taking away from not correct. And I that think that's what trump that's why I'm just thinking I'm considered I said radical. So. I think because that's where the parent like feeling like I'm in charge, I say you just have to listen because I'm the parent. That's where I, I think I'm considered radical. So, I, 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 like, where, help me out, Momo. Like, where does that go wrong, though, with with Mrs. Heller's? Uh, yeah, yeah, I pretty, don't know that it does go wrong. Does though. it? I, because I think so a far, lot of people are me. parenting probably the way that I'm doing this, and that's yeah. why you're being so why you're so popular and successful because people are like, oh my gosh, this like, is this. the radical. This is yeah. part of the radicalism. I'm gonna insert while you work on a a, a way to you're pull gonna, your trump card back. <laughs> is this Donald? This Lizzie? actually yeah, happened to trump. me. <laughs> Yeah, go on. This actually happened to me when I first got my license. Like, this is a theoretical scenario. Yeah. True story. This happened. I was in LA, California. I just get my license and I ask my mother, Can, we're all going out for Matzah Shabbos pizza. It's Ben Azmanim. Classic 11th graders, you know, like four guys, three cars, <laughs> and we're going to pizza, right? So can I please borrow the car? And she's like, no, you, like, I'm not ready to give you my car. And... I'm like, why not? She's like, you just got your license. Like you haven't like practiced enough. Yeah. And my argument was, Ma, the state of California <laughs> trusts me with a car. And, you and my don't. own mother <laughs> doesn't. Right? So and so she gave me the car. Mm. Totaled. What? Uh, Are you okay? First time. <laughs> are you okay, Mom? I'm okay. <laughs> Shua Libovics, how are you, dude? Backed up right into the car um, and like side swiped it right in front of his parents' house. It was amazing. My mother's car was white. His mother's car was blue. It looked like <laughs> a race car. Dented and a side <laughs> across. By the way, it's ironic because the state of California just really isn't that trustworthy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, totally. yeah. I asked Shua's father, who is my dentist, Dr. Dr. Leibovitz, to call my mother you and were, tell her oh, that oh. this really was not my fault. Yeah. So yeah, trust in giving well, a car. You're not going to stop there. What happened? <laughs> I mean, Bar Hashem, it all worked he out. Call, he called for you? Yeah. yeah. Dr. See, but in called. that situation, if I was a mother, I don't think I would have given the car at that point. Mm -hmm. I would, I, then I so would, how do you I would say no? How, I would express my honesty again. And I would say, even if, the, I'll explain to you something, even though the state trusts you, I get it, but that's just like for a whole, whatever. I know you personally, I know how much practice you had. And I personally just don't feel comfortable. I feel really, really worried. Could we build up to that slowly? Like, let's figure out a plan that I feel much more comfortable with. I love you. I know you want the car so badly. And at the same time, I really want to make sure that I'm doing my job and ensuring that you're really safe. And, and that's how I would communicate with my child. Now, yeah. people say like, oh, your child's not going to listen to you. They're not going to, you have to realize this is built on years and years and years of doing this where you are, like you said, unwaveringly honest. Do you know how sometimes how uncomfortable it is for me to have to push myself to be as honest as I am? But I want to. I want to be that honest because that's the kind of parenting that I want. I want to be that kind well, of that's parent. That's how you build a, a foundation or a real relationship. If Correct. it's built on lies, then. Correct. Wow. Okay. So like the, the, the number one thing I, I i have in my mind is like don't lie to your kid yeah even if you're but trying not even to lying. don't hide your agenda i think like just be be, be, be sh transparent be totally transparent yeah and if you can't be transparent then there are ways there are ways there are times that i'm not that i wasn't so comfortable being transparent there are times i still am i'm not and there's still see this is the thing that once if you build this kind of relationship with your child where you're honest or transparent there is room and leeway for you to just be like, just do this because I said, okay, just, and my children will comply because I, I'm so reasonable. I'm so honest. Because you have that credibility. I, exactly. They'll be like, fine. Okay. Mommy said, fine. It's built up. I guess it's important. Fine. So, so take parent who is listening to this podcast and they're like, you know what? Every night it's a fight. I, I want to try this. I want to yeah. try this. Yeah. So they got to start now yeah. from you know, they're, they have a 12 year old, they have a 14 year old, a six year old. And they're like, no, nah, I, I want to try this. Yeah. What's their first step? Ooh, their first step. Um, that's a really good question. I wouldn't want them to just like start. Like, I think actually the first step is to be honest with the children and to tell them that you want to switch things over. Really? Yeah. Sit them down. Yeah. Team meeting. Yeah, exactly. I think so. I saying like until now I've been doing it this way 
And I'm really recognizing that I don't like it and I don't, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy pushing you every single day to do things. I don't enjoy always holding leverage over your head. And I want to do it differently. Uh, I, I'm still learning, but like, bear with me. And this is the first thing that I want to change or this is what I want to do. That's differently. super vulnerable for a yes. parent to go to a kid and be like, yes, this is a, this is like, this is something I'm, uh, it's yeah. my job to be a parent to you Yeah, and it's my being and I want to do it better. Yeah. I think so often a parent child relationship is very, yes, this is just this authoritative. Is, this is it. Yeah. Like I'm the parent, you're the child. Right. And, but what you're saying is it's so funny. It brings me back to when I was a counselor in camp, which by the way, I feel like more kids should be counselors in camp. You know, like <laughs> it's like not a thing anymore. People are just like, they like, you know, remember when we were in camp miscellaneous junior staff? Yes. So now like, I don't know, like teen programs and stuff like that. Shout out to the teen program, but be counselors. Anyways, I one I was a JC and I had a counselor. That segment has been sponsored by <laughs> Camp. <Come on. laughs> um, yeah, uh, so much in my head. Yes, yeah, so um, you're saying about being a counselor. Yeah, so I remember my first week I was a JC and I had a I was a I was JC and the counselor was his name was Ezra Pultman, and we had a very very difficult bunk type of bunk like we put, first night. You know what? We did this. They're all in bed. We're going to go play basketball. They were, I think, like 12, 12, 13 years old, something like that. We go to the basketball court. You know, camp. It's like 2 a.m. We're shooting hoops and eating doggies probably and ruining our insides. Um, and we got a call from the head counselor. He's like, where are you guys? We're like, kids are sleeping. He's like, You're He's like are they, though? He's like, there are, there are kids in your bunk who are walking around the bunk area right now. It's 2.30 a.m. It's the first night of camp. We're like, you got the wrong bunk. Our kids are in bed. We get, it was, they just, they pulled, they pulled the wool over our eyes the first night. They all, f like, they, they, to be yeah, they, they, first they pulled the wool over their own eyes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but I like what we did there. Yeah. And we came back and then the next six days was literal. Like it was, it was just clashing. It was us trying to be drill sergeants. Don't do that. Get into bed. Do this, do that. And I remember Friday I went, I called my mother and he went to call it like to say good job to our parents. And we both like met up in the middle of the bunk area and we were both like had tears in our eyes. Like this isn't fun. Like this isn't enjoyable. We're not, when this is not, it's not enjoyable. We need to change something. And we did have the conversation with, with the campers, but we kind of like changed our, our, our model from being drill sergeant to being like security guard. Like just, just make sure no one gets killed. <laughs> you know, like let's not try to make sure everyone walks in a, but, and I think the key there was enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, you could, it could be enjoyable. Yes. Yes. Preach. I felt like the drill sergeant. And I know other parents feel that way too. There's no way. If I felt that way, other parents feel that way too. I know. Exactly. And it's like, why? Why are we making ourselves into drill sergeants when we can? I always say that my favorite line is come alongside our children. Just come alongside them. Yes, you're their parent. You're still like here and they're here, but you're on this, you're on the same path. You're working together. You're, you know, the clashing is so, it's, 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 it's torture for everyone. Not yeah. just for the child, for the parent too. No, it's, it, it, yeah. is. it is. It. I remember going to sleep every single night, feeling defeated, terrible, ho feeling awful about all the decisions I made that day, wondering why I'm always clashing with my child. I yeah. have a question. So, well, luckily you're the co-host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to invite you to speak to the parent who is intrigued mm -hmm. by the approach, mm -hmm. but is fearful. Yeah, that maybe they don't have the dialogue skills that you mm. have and the quick like orator that because yeah, you're really like, good at respond it. with like this really great response and they're afraid mm -hmm. that their child is going to walk all over them yeah this is you know I, i'm so happy you brought that up because i think it's very real like and there is such a thing also as like children walking all over their parents i think it's because it's not because the child wants to or is like looking to take away the parent's power i think we talk a lot that's another thing in our culture it's always like as if like you need to show that you're boss. Like I was, I really bought into that, you know, until I was like, wait, who said, you know? Mm. So I really don't think your child's trying to take away your power, but a child might walk all over a parent. If a parent um, doesn't assert themselves or doesn't create that safety that the child's looking for. So then the child's like, well, then if so, if someone needs to be in charge here, then I guess it, I guess I need to be or something like that. It's sort of like them trying to fill a role that isn't being filled. Uh, and I think it comes from a place of insecurity, not security or safety. So, um, but I think that a parent who, do you think I have the dialogue skills? Like I still don't, by yeah. the way, I, I still, <laughs> kind of. I still don't No, I still don't. I'm still learning by the way. I think that, so I would tell a parent to start slow. They don't have to just like do it all in one, whatever, but also they can get coaching. 
They can look in, like there's so much available out there for how to learn how to do it differently, to learn how to navigate things differently. I practice with people. I know this might sound funny, but I really do. I go to courses where we practice speaking in this honest way because it, I know you you think that it's I'm very skilled at it, but I, I'm not necessarily. I still have a lot to grow. And so and I, it's something that I'm passionate about. I really want to, especially as my children get grow older, they have to become, my skills have to get even better. And so I really want to be able to do that so they can learn. And then as they learn, they can do it. Now about the child not taking advantage, like walking all over them. I think that's more about, not about the child parent being able to like, you know, have the skills to narrate back or whatever. I think it's more about the parent having a sense of like conf, inner confidence and a sense of like, I got this. I think that a child can, any person really can sense that. And so I think it's about parents, a parent tapping into that part of themselves and, and learning how to do that. And also learning how to, speaking about honesty, assert themselves. Like this way of parenting is not about a parent just being, I think that sometimes parents, people get the, well, not from what I said, but sometimes from what I share, they get the idea that it's about just like whatever the parent, child wants. Right. We're just going to do whatever the child wants because it's about the relationship. So of course, like if this is not about that at all. It's about there's both of you here. And so I'm going to absolutely voice my own needs and mm -hmm. voice what is what doesn't work for me or whatever it is. And so in that way, you're not being, you know, walked all over. I like very much the point that you're making because yeah. I hear Hasidus, mm -hmm. which is a obviously a a modality yes. of Yiddishkeit. Yiddishkeit, exactly. People conflate and there's a misconception that when everything is about our relationship with Hashem that's a license to do whatever you want. Right. And that's, there's nothing farther from the truth. Right. It's entirely erroneous. See, this teaches that, yes, the entire focus of the entire Taira and Yiddishkeit is to facilitate. It's a vessel for our relationship with the Eberster, with Hashem. Mm -hmm. But of course it matters whether or not you're listening to what the parent is asking of you and what the parent expects sometimes of the of the child. It's There, it, there can be... There can be an expectation and there can be a, this is not okay, even though we've engaged in this dialogue for this and this reason. Correct. And it's not always like you're saying, just do whatever you want. Yes. Even though it is about the relationship. Yes, exactly. I love that you, I guess it's the Hasidish way of parenting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a story to, to demonstrate this. So this has nothing to do with, it wasn't about parenting, it was about me. My child kept leaving her stuff around the house. And I, every time she would, I would remind her and I would say, please put it away. Please put it where it belongs. Please put it in the garbage. And she would, first she did it and she would just like every time like kvetch, you know, and be like, you know, and then it got to a point where she was like, stop telling me to clean up after myself. Like just getting really frustrated. And at first I was very like, you know, and that's the thing also you should realize, like I'm a person, a human being just like anybody else, just because I talk about this parenting approach, I don't always follow it. I was like, went back to the old, you know, school mindset. We're like, I'm the parent. I told you to do it. You should do it. That's really, I was stuck in that. And so I was just like, well, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just continue down my path for about two weeks until finally, I got to a point where I was like, this isn't fun. Yeah. I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. And suddenly I was reminded of ding, ding, ding. Let's have a dialogue. And so I sat down with her and I said, you hate when I tell you to clean up after yourself. She goes, I hate it. Oh, why are you always telling me? And so, and then when I sat down with her, suddenly it came back to me how I felt when my mother used to do it. And I was like, right. Is it like, it just feels like you're constantly being told what to do and you just want to rest and you don't want them to always be mm. down your back and to nag you. And she says, yes. I said, I totally get it. So now it wasn't just like, okay, fine. So I'm just never going to nag you anymore. I was like, okay, but I'm still really concerned about all the things that could be left around. And I said, I don't want to be the one to have to clean them. What's going to happen is that I'm just going to be left with them and I don't want to have to clean them. So she said, okay, I hear you. So she tells me, so what if, you know what, what could we do this? Every time you see something around, say, I'll clean it up for you, but please remember to do it next time. This was her solution. So I said, okay, I like it. My only worry is that I'm going to end up just doing everything for you all the time. Like how, so she goes, can we just try it? Let's try it. I said, you know what? Let's try it for three weeks. And uh -huh. then we will re come back to it and see. It's been around probably two months. Wow. It's been amazing. Since then, she's cleaning up after herself. She's trying to prove it to you also. <laughs> it could be, but also because she just wanted to be like, stop nagging me. And once right. she felt no, I think that it's relief. For I, sure both. But like, yeah. you know, that for sure. But also it sounds like when she, when she said to you, just let's try it. Give me a free yeah. trial. Yeah. I want to. It seems like she had that, that just like that. She wants to try. She wants yeah. to prove to you that yeah. take me by my word. I can show you I could do it. Exactly. And she has, she has. How old, Most is, she? How old is this? She's almost 12. Wow. Most of the time she's been cleaning up after herself. Has there been times where I've done it? 
but much less than I used to. And I'm so happy with it. It's working for both of us. So that's an example of a dialogue where I, I don't treat myself like I'm the shmata, like, you know, and we, and we really work together. And I really believe children are so, so willing to work right. together when we sit down and, and share like that with them. I also like how it, it sort of forces one to separate one's position from one's interests, right? Okay. My, one of my professors in, in school would, would teach us this about, it's a negotiation tactic actually, but when two parties are trying to negotiate through something, it's always helpful to separate one's interest from one's position. Okay. Right? So I take the position, I need you to turn up the heat in okay. the room. Mm. And you're like, no, I don't want to turn on, I don't want to turn up the heat. I'm comfortable with the temperature. And the position that I keep taking is, no, raise the heat, raise the heat. And if you separate my position from my interest, which is that I'm just cold. Yes. You can offer me a sweater yes. and maintain your position. I love how you, interest. yeah, I love how you speak about position versus interest. For me, for me, it's about uh, separating strategy and need. I have a need for want, for cleanliness and not wanting to have to carry the responsibility of another person. My my strategy is to keep asking her to clean up. So we're, I'm, I'm separating them. Exactly. And Ex your interest is in a clean house. Exactly. Your position keeps on being clean up, clean up, clean up. But you're actually dialoguing, you're communicating with your child that wouldn't it be awesome to live in a clean house? Right. Like, how do we create this and make this happen? We, exactly. So it's that we're not we're not attached to strategy. Now, here's the thing in parenting. I think parents get very attached to strategies. The funniest thing is that we'll always we'll always like, uh, you know, what's the word called? Um, I think like make fun of children or, or say that children harp on strategies. We'll always say my child is so stubborn. They're so stuck. And the funniest part is that parents are just as stubborn. Parents are very attached to their strategies. Like, like you said, put up the heat, put up the heat. The up. Instead of talking about I'm cold, let's figure out a solution. They're obsessed with a strategy. It needs to be exactly this. And you know, and there, but I think the reason why we're attached to strategies is because we're worried that our need won't get met otherwise. Mm -hmm. Like this is the only way I know that I'm going to stay warm is if you turn up the heat. Maybe there's but another we're way. Not open to the vessel is the relationship though. If there's a relationship there, then we have to get to the bottom of one's exactly. interest. So it's like we need to be open to alternate ways of getting to the same goal. It's my my professor. Uh, his name was <laughs> I don't remember his first name. Didn't really he didn't go go to class often. Actually, no, Bessel he, probably. Yeah, I think Bessel. Yeah, good old Bessel. It was Bessel's uh, grandfather. His last name was actually Shapiro, not Shapiro. Everyone thought he was Jewish. His name was Shapiro. He wasn't oh, my professor. He wrote so a, he wrote a book on negotiations, and I read this. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was the big win versus small win, mm -hmm. uh, th theory. And it, it goes to both of what, what you guys are saying here, yeah. which is, you know, everyone in negotiation, you, you walk in brand new, you're like, you know what? I want to win and they need to lose. But any good negotiator knows that if you win and they lose, they're never going to negotiate with you again. Right. You need to win and they need to win. Right. So they didn't turn up the heat, yet you were warm because you got the sweater. And with a, with, a, with a child, if they're always walking away from the, you know, proverbial negotiation table, losing... They're going to stop negotiating with you. Correct. And you need to make sure that they walk away with a win, even if it's a smaller win than you got. Yeah. And I think it's a both. Buy my both course, NachiGordon.com. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that they, it's really about both parents. I mean, I don't even think of it as winning. I just think that both, par both parent and child are getting what they need. Yeah. And they're not attached to the strategy. They're not, you know, like you said, to the position. They're like, let's just find what meets both of our interests. I well, love let's, that. Let's be real, though. The, 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 okay. I think the thing here is gaiva and it's ego as a parent mm. it's like sometimes we can get stuck in a position because i'm the parent yes and you're not gonna push me off my position yeah yeah i think so because i, think I right. said so yeah how do you get a parent off that mountain i don't know a parent has to want to get off that mountain i've it, been there yeah. i've been stuck there i still get stuck there it's it's just part of you know being human, I guess. and uh, But a parent has to want to be open to not being stuck on there. If, if Some parents are not. Yeah. You know, I share my information. There are plenty of parents who say like, no, but the parent has to be the one and they say no. And and I find it's actually usually men who are more, more uh, that's what I usually like, find. Yeah. They're usually the ones who are more like, what are you saying? Well, like, I find no, it's the opposite, I'm, you know? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That's what I find. Now, again, it could yeah. be just the people who speak to me. I don't know. And and yeah, no, well, there's women who also will say that. And they're very, and I say, you know what? That's fine. Like, that's your prerogative. You don't have to agree with what I'm saying. And it, it, I'm only sharing it for parents who will speak to you. It really speaks to me. It saved my life mm -hmm. and my children's lives, I think. Yeah. And um, are your children appreciative of it? Are, are they appreciative oh, of it? They're they? extremely, that's also another thing. People always say, oh, children will always have complaints no matter what you do. It's not true. My children, my children think they have the best 
Well, they will, they'll say, they'll say, I don't know if you're the best because I don't know what other people have, <laughs> you know, but, but they do. They're it's pretty close. They absolutely <laughs> feel incredibly blessed that I parent the way that I do. A hundred percent. We'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Hi, <laughs> didn't do it. Right back. What? <laughs> right back. Um, Pesach's coming really, really quickly. And you know what? If you haven't gone to the grocery yet and started Pesach's cooking. Pesach's coming in hot. It's coming in hot. It's coming in fresh. But not as fresh as the food from Batya's Kitchen. Very deep. Very deep. Guess what? Guess what, Momo? Do you know who ships anywhere in the U.S.? Batya's Kitchen. Do you know that people could take it on a plane? It's packaged specifically for that purpose? Batya's Kitchen. Do you know that they do private... like a question. Do you know that they do private trucking to Orlando? Batya's Kitchen. They have yummy food, heaven food, and it's freedom from the kitchen to enjoy your loved ones because that's what Pesach is about. It's about leaving exile, leaving the kitchen, and you can do that by heading to batyaskitchen.com. Amazing food, amazing service. It's the only people, it's the only people that you need helping you when it comes to Pesach. Besides Partner with Batya's Kitchen to make a moira digger Pesach. <laughs> right? Do it again. A moira digger Pesach. <laughs> Batya's Kitchen. Enjoy the rest of this episode, folks. So I want to get to some... Uh, there's a lot of people who ask questions on okay. Instagram. Yeah. I'll get to that in a second. But first, uh, while, while I gather them, if you can um, give us maybe five do's and don'ts. Like, mm. you know, I think there are things, you know, the Pope... Five's a big number, dude. Five is a lot? Three. Let's go to three. We'll cut it in half. Or two and a half with three. <laughs> oh, I, I, my Shapiro guy, my uh, math teacher wasn't good. Um, <laughs> give me three do's and don'ts. But like... In terms of the don'ts, I'm looking for like red flags, you know, like the poker chip thing. You take away poker chips, give poker chips, right? What are like the don'ts that are going to take away 5,000 poker chips from your kid mm. and leave them on empty? And what do's are going to really infuse your kid with confidence to go on and, and just like be out there in the world and have be confidence and, yeah. and have self-esteem? Yeah. I'll tell you the truth. I, I, I worry. Yeah. Be honest. I worry about saying do's and don'ts. Okay. Um, I, I don't mind doing it, you know, but I'll tell you the truth. I find that like those are not as helpful to parents because I think what happens with the like do's and don'ts, they feel a lot of pressure. It's like they live and die by them and they're not. Yeah. I think it's more about the big picture. And I also really, really hate when parents get like too uh, obsessed with like strategies, like I spoke about right. and, and focus on the, instead of focusing on the big picture and it's like, oh my gosh, I should do this and I shouldn't do that. And then they feel really ashamed that they do do those things. And so there's your first don't, which is yeah. one is no <laughs> do or don't. Got one out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, and I don't mind sharing. I don't mind sharing them, but I, I just wanted to put out that this sure. that disclaimer is like take it with a grain of salt, and like yeah, it's just remember it's about the bigger picture. So I would say do's take your children's feelings seriously. I know that some people say you know don't really understand the importance of it, and we didn't even touch on that here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but really, it's about helping. There's so many reasons why it's important, but feelings are a part of life. They're inescapable. We can't escape them. We're feeling human beings. Hashem put it in us. So whether you like it or not, you have it. Now, I think the healthiest way to deal with them is to just accept them and let them be, and then let them move out of you. And all the other ways I find create all kinds of mutations that are wreak havoc in our lives. So the first one is to simply welcome your children's feelings. That doesn't mean that you have to follow their feelings. It doesn't mean you have to abide by them or obey their feelings. Feelings are just feelings. We don't have to obey our own feelings either, but we can let them be. We can just name them and let them exist. So that's the first thing. It's just let your children's feelings be and and allow them to be. You know, you know, it, like just the other day, my child, uh, we, we were going to go all go shopping for Purim and she didn't want to. She's like, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to. I don't want to. And at first I felt the urge to say like, oh, stop making a big deal about. And I was like, no, you're allowed to make a big deal. And we're still going to go party shopping. Both can exist at the same time. I don't have to shut your feelings down in order for us to go. Did she go? Yeah, of course she went. How? Because because she 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 because <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Hit her with a baseball bat. No. Tied her up. Put her <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say like that's she knew that she, she if I say like okay we're going she's she's going. You know, I say, okay, I know you really don't like to, but that's so what that's, we're doing. Um, so again, that's a very important point because people yeah. might think like this, you know, yeah. you're just saying yeah. yes to everything right. your kids are I'm putting telling down. You, there's always but it's not the case. No, not at all. And oh, and here's another thing. I didn't either have a conversation with her about that. You see, like in this situation, I didn't say, okay, you don't want to go. Let's have a conversation. Right. Not everything. Cause I don't always have the time. I don't always have the, you know, that's the thing. And that's the thing is that parents get scared when they hear this whole thing about conversation. Cause they're like, I have everything to do a conversation. It's a full-time you to, job. Yeah. You have to get your child's <laughs> input for everything. What if you have seven children? And so it's not really the case. It's about big things. We'll have conversations about things that are like causing a lot of like tension or whatever. Small things. Yeah. I'll welcome my child's feelings and say, we're still going. Like, that's just what we're doing. Right. And then we're going to go. But I allow them to feel however they feel. So I was like, You're, you can be unhappy about it. You don't have to be happy. It's totally fine. And I don't say that in a snarky way. I really mean it. 
I love that. Yeah. I love that because like I, I, I forgot who me and my wife, we, we discussed this once that we, we saw in, in a, maybe a recording. Maybe it was Matthias Barker. I don't remember. But like, you know, you tell your kid, uh, do the dishes and they get upset and they're yeah. like, I don't want to like, why as a parent, like your kid doesn't need to be happy to do something like that. Yeah. They're still going to do it. Yeah. But they don't need to, they don't, they don't need to do it happily. Exactly. No say, you don't have to do the dishes with a smile on your face. Like that's come. That's ridiculous. Right. That's what a lot of us. I think a lot of us were raised that way. It was like our parents didn't only really control what we did, but also how we felt. And it's like you're, they're allowed to feel however they feel. They don't always have a choice over what gets done or what they have to do or whatever. But they're allowed to feel however they feel. You know. And it's like we try to control the feelings. I think a lot of times because we want to feel better about the decisions that we've made. So it's like so I can feel better that I'm making you go to the store. If you're un- not unhappy, then I you know I feel better about it. It all goes back to that. <laughs> it's like again, it's it's also ego. Right. And so and also just being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable like it's okay if everyone's uncomfortable we don't have to always be comfortable it's fine so yeah that's the first one i mean it's really a lot of dues <laughs> but yeah it's Give me a like, don't yeah yeah so okay so now the a, a don't well a don't could be the opposite of that which is like <laughs> don't shut your children's ugh, what some uh, hair is in my eye don't shut your children's feelings down you know well we could do that that's an, a what like basically right. if your children express anything or whatever wow sorry it's okay no worries uh we'll edit this part out don't worry um if our children, yeah, if they express something to you or whatever is not to punish or, oh, okay, this is actually a good don't because I think this is what some parents do of our generation is they try to save their children from their feelings. So they think like, wait, I'm not shutting down the feeling, right? I'm not saying don't do this or don't feel this. I'm rescue. Exactly. So they'll be like, I'm going to get you a prize at the store. I'm going to, I'm going to get you a lollipop at the store, oh, right? Man. I'm going to, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's actually a parent who came to me once who said that her parents did this all the time. They would come home and be in a bad mood. A parent would say, come, we're going to go out for ice cream or, and they said they were, and she, she loved it as a child. She thought her parents were so caring and loving. Then she became an adult and she says she deals with crippling anxiety. She cannot deal with any distress. Mm. So it's not really a kindness to our children when we save and rescue them from their feelings. Now, again, do we some don't do all parents sometimes like do that? Of course. So do I. We're talking about overall, right? We don't want to rescue our children from their unpleasant feelings. Like I said, it's okay for let everyone. them cry. Yeah. Let them be upset. You know, I always go shopping in stores. And what I see mostly with ch- young children is parents going, shh, shh, stop crying. Or here's a lolly. Here's a lolly. Right. And again, I understand because maybe they don't want to disturb other people in the store or whatever. Yeah. But it's just fascinating to watch how everyone's so uncomfortable with children crying or being upset. And it's okay. It's okay. Like you don't have to save or rescue them from their bad feelings. Now, again, I do think that we should be there for their feelings. Meaning they they shouldn't be alone in their feelings. They should feel like somebody understands and someone's there. And you say, oh, you're so upset because we're not getting that thing. I know it's so upsetting when you don't get what you want or whatever. But nobody wants their kid to have a tantrum in the grocery store. Right, You're by by McGill and a kid's screaming. No, for sure you're going to. You're not going to give them the lolly. No, of course you will. That's what I'm saying. It's all circumstantial for sure. You think I haven't done that and I still don't do that? For sure. It's just about overall, what are you doing? You know? It can't be a fear of yours for them to cry. Exactly, exactly. I want to highlight a a theme that I've heard a couple of times Okay. where... I think parents, uh, a pitfall for parents can be trying to solve the immediate issue yes, yes. as opposed to taking a big picture approach okay. where we're building life skills yes. for our children. Yes. Um, and you mentioned where if, if a child is rescued always from discomfort, yes. then as an adult, it's yes. a very important skill to be able to- Tolerate discomfort. Exactly. And you mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversation where when there's honesty and when there's dialogue and conversation and communication, that's a skill that children are going to have to develop to draw upon when they're older. And I, I love that thread that like flows through all of your your techniques. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, we're, we're trying to like really, I think, do what really I think parenting was designed to do and is to help our children have the skills for life. You know, instead of just being like a short term game, I really think of that. I think it's punishments, rewards, all is very short term to sort of serve the, like the immediate needs of like the parent or whatever, instead of thinking like what's long term going to serve everybody, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I'd love to use that framework to, to highlight a distinction where taking us back a little earlier in the conversation, you were mentioning the importance of being honest and being open and being transparent. And I think people conflate that with oversharing. Mm. And as a parent, of six children, there are things that would be inappropriate for me to share with my children. Absolutely. And I think it's important to to highlight the distinction for our listeners. Being entirely honest and transparent is not the same as not being boundaried and not maintaining privacy. Correct. I'm really happy you mentioned that actually, because that did cross my mind when I said about honesty and transparency. Um, Yes, exactly. Like transparency means that I'm sharing 
in relation to this situation specifically, I'm sharing what my concerns are that pertain to the child and what they need to know for that situation. I'm not sharing something that is about me and that I need to really share with a therapist or with a friend or whatever. Those things are absolutely not the child's, not their place. They don't need to know. yeah. Yeah. And here's another thing also with honesty. And this is a little trick here. There's two types of honesty to me. There's a type of honesty where we actually put the responsibility on the other person to take responsibility for our feelings and our needs. And we also shame or blame them in some way, make them responsible or something's wrong with them versus the other type of honesty where we take responsibility for our feelings and needs and instead invite them to sort of resolve it with us. And so that's the kind of honesty I'm advocating for. I'm not saying like, be honest with your children and say like, you drive me crazy. You always, that's really, I think that kind of honesty actually can be very harmful. I'm talking about, instead of driving you drive me crazy is saying something like i'm noticing i feel really irritated i need some space right now i'm going to take a few minutes and then i'll get back to you that's the kind of honesty honesty i'm advocating for yeah. and and we're my wife and i we're very open with our kids when there's something that it's not for their knowledge right like, correct same. we have like a, a nusach that we'll use be honest about that as well yeah like yes. we'll use a nusach like they'll ask the question in the dialogue and i'll be like Oh, that's like a business thing. And mm-hmm. they're like a business thing. I'm like, yeah, none of yours though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband and I will say it's private. It's private. And, and exactly, but that's, that's a nice honest way of too. Saying, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's honest too. You know, it's private. It's for not for something. And, and again, they'll be very curious and be like, but it's not fair. Why do you talk about it in front of us then? You know, yeah. and then I can empathize with them and also maybe be a little bit more considerate. Like, actually, you know what? We'll try to, if it's not about something that you need to know about, maybe we'll try to be more careful. First question I want to read here. And we have a bunch. Best way to connect with a teen who seems to get mad at us no matter what we do. Mm. How do you connect with a teen like that? Yeah. Ugh, these questions are always so hard for me to answer. I've got you a good disclaimer. You're not giving. Uh, no, I'll tell you why. No, I'll tell you why. I, 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 I'll tell you why. I'll say, I'll say, I'll give an answer, but I'll tell you why it's really hard for me to answer. Sure. I don't know why this teen is acting that way. See, True. For, for me, I'm always viewing things through the lens of why. I want to understand where the child's coming from. So that's an answer in from. itself. Get to know. Get to know why. There you go. But it's really tricky for parents who don't have such a great relationship with their child because they're. And, and here's another thing. When Gotta I say peel it back. When I say a, a why, a lot of parents will think that means going over to our child and say, "Why do you talk like this? Why are you so angry at us all the time?" I always say children usually have no clue why. By the way, even adults have no idea why. I don't know why I do what I do half the time. <laughs> No, I'm honest. I'm not even joking about that. For real. Yeah. And, and and I really, I need time to process why I did what I did. I need another person to help me understand why I did what I did. Like, not by guessing, but like reflecting with me and sort of being like, was it this or, you know, and, and same with our children. I don't think that ever asking them why is helpful. I think it's more about getting curious. That's why I always say get curious. So that, you know, in whichever way that looks. Now, again, if you don't have such a great rapport with that child, you start getting curious, he's going to walk off. Yeah. Right. So it's very tricky. Got to start from Aleph. <laughs> no, but again, I don't want every parent to feel like they have to like give up. So I would say that with a child like that, don't start with finding out why. Probably it's uh, that's probably jumping too far ahead. I probably would say start just um, developing a relationship with them. Right. That's what I mean by by starting from yeah. Aleph. I think it was a Satma Rebbe. Oh, yeah. Who, when he it came, he was doing, giving a dot for me share. And no, Dafiomi Shir sounds suspect so far. on the fact so far, but okay. Still listening. G- giving a Dafiomi Shir in the east side of manhattan and um he would spend the first like half hour of the year just schmoozing with the people many of which were holocaust survivors who didn't really have families and you know the the people in the year said to him you know rebbe why why are we spending so much talking we could have been already finished with this ahmed and that ahmed he said here in this year we start we start by daf uh, by daf alif mm-hmm. and daf alif is getting to know you better and you getting to know me and having a good relationship yeah. and of course in gemara there's no daf alif it starts by bays but that is the daf alif and for parents or bayim teachers anyone sometimes it's important to go to to that Exactly. So I would say, I would say, try to like in, have a relationship with them on their terms rather than on yours. A lot of parents will say, no, but I, I don't want to sit down and watch a game with them or I don't want, I don't care about baseball or I don't care. Well, that's what your child's interested in. And at this point, if you want to build a relationship with them, then get into their world and do things. Of course, you don't have to push yourself too much outside your comfort zone if something's not your standards or whatever, but, and, and, and relate to them through that. And then slowly through that, you'll build a relationship and then hopefully be able to understand what's going on for them. I'm sure there's a very valid reason why this child is upset i don't know the reason why though interesting now i want to there's, there's honestly there's so much to cover and there's gonna have to be a part two <laughs> and uh you know because yeah it's i didn't just, even get to like it's crazy the, yeah. like we're, we're we we just but it's so important we, like, yeah. we really are uncovering something that's so important and that's just yeah. 
listen, parenting <laughs> is is not it's like life's work. It, it, you're yeah. not going to cover the entire thing of parenting in an hour. It's just not going to happen. People uh, also think it gets easier as your kids get older. Erroneous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I actually at this point, I really like I like the challenge because it's not the kind of challenge where like I'm fighting against them. It's more about like I am forced to grow in certain challenging ways. Challenging yourself, you know? really. exactly, exactly. I want to ask you if you can really let's speak to the kids, mm-hmm. you're right? You know the kids who aren't understanding their parents. Let's say there are, there are teenagers listening right now. Mm-hmm. I know maybe some of my nephews, they like <laughs> listening and they use the, they use what they hear in these podcasts as ammo against their parents. Like, <laughs> you heard what she said? Why don't you do that? Huh? <laughs> huh? Um, so let's, let's speak to the kids. How, how can a kid be more of a, like we're, we're, we're speaking a lot about how a parent can be a better parent. How yeah. can a kid be a better kid? Mm. Like be more at the table. I, th- I think I would say the same thing to them is to be honest as well. Meaning instead of saying like, ma, why don't you parent the way that is actually to come with transparent kind of honesty with like, you know, when you speak to me in that way, I feel um, like slighted or I feel like you're not really hearing me and it's frustrating. I wish that you would hear me more or, or if they feel like that's, that's like a dramatic thing to do. And it's very vulnerable. Yeah, right? it is. Yeah. I mean, that's still the <laughs> advice that I would give. <laughs> Just be- pull a fire alarm kids. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that that's what parent, I think parents will be able to hear that. Right. When we come with like the, like, you know, powerful sort of energy and, you know, trying to like be like, you should parent that way or telling them how they're a terrible parent. A parent's defenses go up. It really works the same way. They're a human being just like your kid, the kids are. Could we give like a universal sign for all the teenagers listening? If you're listening and you want to like give your parent like, you know, like just go over them and, and give them a nice two clap. <laughs> no? Like a nice two clap on the back. And then they'll know and you don't have to be vulnerable and, <laughs> and they'll understand exactly. Oh, you heard it, huh? <laughs> you can write, they can write in a letter if they want to. Yeah. But no, I really think that a parent, otherwise a parent, this is the, this is the travesty. I wish all parents had the skills. To be able to hear, see, or hear the vulnerable message underneath any words our child says. Like when my child comes to me and says, I hate you, I don't hear I hate you. What I immediately hear something's going on for you that's very important and I wanna hear what's going on. That's what I hear. And honestly, I hear this. This is not even like, and some parents are at a place where they don't hear that. They hear, I hate you. And they take it personally and they become very defensive and whatever. And I, I have a lot of compassion for parents who do experience that. But my wish is that every parent really could hear the message. Now, not all parents could. So I think of a child asking me, you know, I don't think it, it necessarily, I understand that the child's uncomfortable, but if they're yeah. really asking me, how do I get through to my parent? I think it is to, instead of sharing the like, you know, aggressive message to share the vulnerable message that you really wish the parent was hearing, would hear when you say, I hate you, or when you say whatever it is that you want to say. And and that's, that's literally, that's a gem. That's important. Um, Let's, let, let's do the double clap still also guys <laughs> um but parents uh spouse and uh, spouses to each other you know let's say they're on different pages yes husband's like all in with this model or let's say the wife is all in with this model and the husband's like shooting cannons at their kids like how can how does a, a spouse a spouse mm-hmm. relationship mm-hmm. get on the same page for something mm-hmm. like this yeah so uh, this is so big by the way and i want to create a course together with my sister who actually is a couples mediator oh, wow. um yeah it's, it's because this is a huge topic for a lot of parents and there's a lot of conflict because of this because a parent, intersection of shalom bias and chinuch. yeah exactly parents, big intersection and especially with like what i'm sharing and other people share there's a lot of parents who like really like you said some fathers some others who it resonates with them and they want to do it so badly and the other parent is doing something totally different and it undoes everything you can't it can't you can't operate in a household where it's two totally radically different things unless i'm you're putting up the stop sign and i'm wrong no i don't know i don't know if you're wrong but i'll tell you how i see it okay, so, so okay so i think that this topic this idea of like both parents being on the exact same page is uh, a problem because either one of two things needs to happen okay for them both to be on the same page Either one parent needs to try to change the other parents, which is a terrible idea, or one parent just needs to shut down what's important to them and mm-hmm. be like, okay, I'm just going to parent the way the other parent does it because we have, both have to be the same, same thing. And I think that's really sad. I think that both of those options are really sad. I think that if a parent really wants to have an authentic kind of relationship with their child, then they can absolutely have that. Every the, Speaking of relationship, a relationship with a mother, a relationship with a father, two separate relationships, right? You don't have yeah. the same relationship with both parents, right? Right. Right. They're each individuals. So I always say that if this is about relationship, then of course you can have that relationship with your child. Now, what do we do though about the fact that like it's totally, okay, different styles. So I think that again, I would, there's, there's two things here. I think that there is such a thing as having a united front. I don't think that means that both of you have to do the exact same thing. I think what that means is that both of you respect each other and don't undermine one another's parenting style. So that means if let's say the father comes in and his style is to punish and, you know, 
then 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 the mother stays out of it and she doesn't walk in and be like what are you doing and in front of the kids so right? un- united front you're saying exactly so she was now again that means also if the children then complain and say i hate that daddy punished me is that she can listen to them and be an empathic presence the same way she is when they don't want to go to the store right and say like oh yeah you really don't like that he did that and without saying he's wrong he shouldn't have done that or he's right how detrimental is that i don't think it's detrimental at all no to to doubt to d- talk oh. down oh that I think is where the problem starts. So it's yes. a fine line. Yes. Well, I, well, to me, the line is that you just listen to them and you don't take a stand with either way. You don't say he was right, he was wrong. All you do is just be there for them. What if he was and, wrong? <laughs> it does happen. <laughs> well, like what if he was wrong and the kid doesn't- Then feel- I then what I do is I approach my husband behind, like quietly, not in front of them. So to their face, I'll say, oh, you really don't want to. And then when I'll go over to him and say, you know, they said before that blah, 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 you might want to know this. And because I know that my husband really wants to hear it because he wants to be a good parent. And so he he wants to hear how they feel about it. Now, again, every situation is different, right? I'm going to put think- you in a bind right now. You ready? I'm okay. Gonna, I'm- okay. Husband, father, he messed mm-hmm. up. He did something. He, yeah. he yeah. you know, he said something or yeah. did something just not nice to the kid. Yeah. And the kid's crying to the mother. I can't believe yeah. Abba Tati Daddy did this. I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. And you as as a mother, you know it was wrong. Yeah. And as a wife, you know it was wrong. Yeah. Isn't it isn't it cruel to not let your child know that, that it like, was wrong and they don't deserve to be treated that way? And without and how do you do that without undermining the other parent? Yeah. So at this point a parent has to make a choice. A parent has to make a choice. Either they can choose to say, Yeah, you don't deserve to be treated that way ever. They could. And then that, you know, that carries its own risks or they can choose not to do that and just really empathize and be like, I know you hate that and you don't want to be and, and, and trust that through the way that you treat them, they get the message that they don't deserve to be treated that way. And both of them carry. How do you make a decision like that? Yeah. And it's I, like I bang, it's, bang. It's like. Yeah, it's hard. And it really depends on the dynamic of the marriage also and the relationship. Like, you know, it depends how the spouse would react to you saying that you didn't deserve that. Like may, what I, my ideally what I would want is for me to go together with that child to the parent and say, this child is saying that they really didn't feel like it was fair that you did them, did that to them or whatever. And to how hopefully the other parents will apologize to the child and say you right. didn't deserve to be treated that way. So it doesn't have to be me who does, says it. They do. Mm. You understand, but again, every dynamic is different. Yeah. But that's ideally what I what I what I like to create. Parent is allowed to apologize to a child. Oh, oh, are you really asking me that? <laughs> <laughs> Setting up for a slam dunk over here. Yeah, absolutely. I think parents should absolutely apologize to their children. Yes, of course. We're human beings just like anybody else, and we make mistakes, and we should absolutely model that for our children. <laughs> Momo, you got anything else? Model for the children. I mean, that's that, that's a big uh, uncontroversial, unradical sort of expe- accepted it is principle. Oh, to, to model, to model for yeah, the, the power of modeling. Right. Actually, my brother-in-law, Moishi Frankel, whose 30th birthday, Hebrew and English was today. Shout out. He told me, um, what you do, that is what is perpetuated. That's what gets passed mm. down. Because kids do as you do, not as you say. Yes, I talk about that all the time. Exactly. That's why I like to live what I talk about instead of just, you know, punishing them or whatever. I try to actually live the values that I'm talking about with my children. So they learn that through me. Um, Oh, I forgot what I wanted to say when you said that about modeling. Oh, one of the things that bothers me, though, when we talk about modeling is that I think and sometimes it creates the idea in our head that we should like be this person. So our child follows us. I think children can see right through that. I think it, I, that's why I don't love the word modeling even, even though I, I also use that word. <laughs> For me, I think it's more about just just be. Mm-hmm. Who you are is what your children will see. So it, you, you understand what I'm saying? The sure. difference is modeling Can't is sort of a sense of faking. Show. Sometimes parents think that that's what they're supposed to do. It's like, oh, I don't want my children to see that I do this, so I'm not going to do it in front of them. I, I don't think that's it. <laughs> mm. That's know? important, by the way. Yeah. Of course. You can't fool your kids, ultimately. No. Oh, my goodness. You cannot fool your kids. Did your parents fool you? My parents did not fool me. No. <laughs> yeah. My son, when I pick him up from school, he's not ready to leave. He tells me to leave. I actually love that question about doesn't want to leave and tells me to go, right? Because yeah. I, I really want to show like what how in this approach. Because, again, a lot of what I'm talking about actually applies to children who are above toddler age. Because for toddlers, I think having conversations, sometimes they're a little too young for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's, they're not ready for that yet. Right. And so the approach that I take with younger kids, but also sometimes even with older ones, is that the child says they don't want to come with me. It's the two step approach. It's empathize and then do whatever you need to do. You're the parent. You're stronger. You're more powerful. You you have all the power. Like I always tell parents, like there's no reason why there needs to even be a power struggle. Right. Again, as they get older. Yes. But that's because hopefully you don't have those because you're 
dialoguing more. But with younger children, all you do is they say, go away, or I don't want to go. And you say, oh, yeah, you really don't want to come with me. Or you try to get understand where they're coming from. Right. And you say, and we're going. And you pick them up and you go. Yeah. And they might be sad and they might be upset and they might be crying and you continue empathizing with them, but you just do what you need to do. So that that would be my advice to that parent is like to, yeah, just sometimes that's toddlers. It can be very challenging. Wow. So where, where can people like hear more of your stuff? Yeah. Well, Instagram, really bleemyheller.com. My website has mm -hmm. all my resources. It also has my Instagram like yeah. is on the bottom so people can see what it is where it is people who don't have instagram i share them whatsapp status as well oh very cool um and i share i try to share more or less daily um little posts of ideas and things that i just put out there uh that make you think Beautiful. a little bit and you know help parents sort of think yeah like think more critically about how they're parenting and how they want to parent and what they might want to be doing differently etc amazing one, one last question yeah sure um, what do you want your kids to say about you as a parent? Mm. I'd may have asked her. Mm. I think that I want them to say that I really tried, that they really sensed that I really cared and that I tried. And that the second thing is that I always was open to hearing how I hurt them. That when they did come to me with complaints or hurts that I was willing to hear it and to not get defensive and to not shut them down or uh, try to explain it away. But I really heard them. Lemmy Heller, thank you so much for joining us on the Meaningful kids are People podcast. Oh, thank you. I don't know. You might have to <laughs> ask them, but thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I want to end with one last message for Please. any parent who listens. I know parents, I've worked with them for so long at this point, over seven years. And I, I know that parents a lot of times feel overwhelmed when they hear everything I have to say, especially if they have children who are older and it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't do any of these things or I'm not doing these things. And I just want to remind parents that, there's so much that you can shift and that you can change. And every little shift in the right direction makes a difference. And all of us are flawed, including myself. Even though I talk about these things all the time, I don't always follow my own advice. And that we're all human beings. We're all on our own journeys and we're all in a different place and that we can always move forward no matter where we are. I just don't want parents to walk away feeling like mm. an incredible amount of like pressure and guilt and shame. Um, I want to feel encouraged. Like I can do something about this rather than, oh, I failed and I'm all a mess, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. That's, that's really important. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Meaningful People. First of You're all, well. I, want, I want to mention a few things, okay? Very important. I hope no one was listening on like 1.5 or no. like two speeds. She speaks, she speaks she fast. Really like lazy. She packs in the info. Like we, the ROI on this interview is really good. Anyways, big shout out to Isaac Newman, our friend. Isaac. How are you over there? How are you doing? Sponsoring another episode of Meaningful People. Isaac Nishmas, his well. mother. Rechama Paramakaleya Bas Ari Leib. Her Nishama Shabin Aliya continue soaring higher. Uh, and and Shepi Nachas from what our family and especially you Isaac what you guys are doing uh, so thank you Amen. thank you for that Amen. Momo did you see those people that dressed up like us on Purim uh oh uh oh did you see that Simchas Piram Mamash Momo Friedman David Aram Sh I would say shout David out David Aram yeah Simchas shout out Piram. shout out to you but you know what like the glasses it's a lot. you know what you it's got a lot. you got the glasses at IQ you got my exact glasses incredible it's unbelievable yeah dude well that was cool didn't think that would happen, huh? <laughs> I don't know if it was cool. It was it was a lot. It was interesting. It was a lot. It right? Definitely. Right? They got the right? Yeah. Right? Anyways, thank you all for listening and watching this podcast. Really appreciate your support always. This episode is super important if you're a parent, if you're a kid. Uh, and go ahead and share this with a parent that you think is a terrible parent. <laughs> I'm Brony. No, but if you're a kid, remember what I said in the episode. Double clap on the back. There you go. If you need your parents, it's just no. Double clap and say meaningful people this week give them a little of a shoulder shake uh but we got more episodes coming your way really good episodes so make sure you hit the subscribe button on apple spotify youtube and uh we're working hard over here we're working hard late at night making sure that you have what to listen to especially when you're scrubbing your floor with a toothbrush cleaning for pesach um my name is nachi gordon and this is momo bauman and thank you we're your friends we come in peace have good a great times. yeah adios you enjoyed this video from meaningful minute we have so much more content for you you may like this you may like this take your pick let us know what you think